Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine Zoominar producer, and I'd like to welcome you to Have I Got a Cartoon for You with Bob Mankoff. Today's the last day of the first annual Martha's Vineyard Jewish Book Festival, held in partnership with Moment Magazine, the Chilmark Library, and the Martha's Vineyard Hebrew Center. We hope you have enjoyed your time with us this week, and only hope we can be together in person next year. Signed copies of Bob's book, along with the rest of the book from this week's festival, are available to purchase on Moment's website at momentmag.com. Now for today's session. For over 40 years, Bob Mankoff has been the driving force of comedy and satire at some of the most honored publications in America, including The New Yorker and Esquire. He has devoted his life to discovering just what makes us laugh and seeks every outlet to do so. Bob is the president of CartoonCollections.com, the world's largest database of cartoons, and he is also the cartoon editor of Graydon Carter's online magazine, Airmail. Please welcome Bob Mankoff. So it says, Rabbi, explain the Talmud to me. And he said, so he says, okay, uh, well, very well. First, I will ask you a question. If two men climb up a chimney and one comes out dirty and one comes out clean, which one washes himself? Hmm. The dirty one, guy says. No. They look at each other. The dirty man thinks he's clean and the clean man thinks he's dirty. Therefore, the clean man washes himself. Huh. Now, another question. If two men climb up a chimney and one comes out dirty and one comes out clean, which one washes himself? Uh, you just told me, Rabbi, the man who is clean washes himself because he thinks he is dirty. No, if they look at themselves, the clean man knows he doesn't have to wash himself. So the dirty man washes himself. Now, one more question. If two men climb up a chimney and one comes out dirty and one comes out clean, which one washes himself? Uh, I don't know, Rabbi. Depends on your point of view. He's annoyed at this point. It could be either one. No, if two men climb up a chimney, how could one man remain clean? They are both dirty. They both wash themselves. Rabbi, you asked me the same question three times. You gave me three different answers. Is this some kind of joke? This is not a joke, my son. This is Talmud. And it actually is a deep lesson here about the limits of reason, how, what, where reason can lead you astray, about, about the practicality of real life versus thinking, and how both of them have to be combined to two. So it's about the importance of philosophy and the danger. It's about the importance of thinking and the dangers of thinking. And one, of, one, one, one thing humor shows up again and again is that you can't overthink things. Uh, so the jokes that what we think of Jewish humor does not really come from the Talmud. There are inklings of it there. But this is a book, Sigmund Freud, Jokes in Their Relation to the Unconscious, a very, very famous book in which Freud, it's 1905. It's, of course, about psychoanalysis. He's trying to explain it. He's linking jokes to dreams and basically saying that jokes uh, are expressions often of our hidden sexuality, hostility, all of these things. But all the jokes that he's talking about are Jewish jokes. <laughs> And why does he have such a font of Jewish jokes in 1905? Already by 1905, there are many, many Jewish joke books, many Jewish joke books. Jews are known as funny and they're also producing humor. I mean, this is besides Shalom Aleichem and Henry ha Henrik Hein and all of that. And the jokes in jokes in their relation to their, are very much Jewish jokes because they're logical jokes, they're conceptual jokes, and I'll tell you a few. So one of them is it's a, it's a matchmaker joke because, you know, at that time in Eastern Europe, there are matchmakers for the bride and the groom. So the matchmaker brings the, uh, the bride to, to the groom and the groom takes over the matchmaker and he whispers, he says, what have you brought me? She's blind in one eye, she has a hunchback, and she's lame. And the matchmaker says, you don't have to whisper, she's deaf too. So that is a logical contradiction joke. Another joke like that, that is, is, that is a thinking joke, is a logical contradiction, is the idea of the schnorra, like the entitled beggar in, 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 in Jewish society, who is, always feels entitled. 
So the Shnara goes to, a, to his patron, the rich man, and says, I'm, I'm not feeling very well. I wonder if you'd give me some money so that I could try to get myself better. And he says, fine, the rich man gives him money. And then the rich man goes to a spa in Vienna, the finest spa in Vienna. And he finds the Schnorra is there. He, all the money he's given them has gone to the Schnorra to, to pay for the fanciest spa in Vienna. And he says, what are you doing here? I gave you money and you're going to the fanciest spa. And the Schnorra says, look, when it comes to my help, money is no object. So Roy put a little thing on that. By the way, a very good book. To about the, the roots of Jewish humor, Jewish humor in general, very, very thorough, is this one by Ruth Weiss, no joke, making Jewish humor. Very, very scholarly, not nearly as funny as have I got a cartoon for you, but worthwhile if you're really interested in looking at it. Okay, now for me, my humor did not come from the Talmud, okay? It came from the Borscht Belt where I saw Alan King and Jackie Mason and Buddy Hackett and Rodney Dangerfield and Jerry Lewis. Now it's very interesting also because when I, uh, when I was, all of these comedians are interesting because they changed their names, right? And, and, and that was a conflict in being Jewish and growing up. I know when I grew up uh, that it was important, <laughs> I mean, a cliche was, you know, dress British and think Yiddish. So all of them changed their names. So here, here are all their real names. Here are all their Jewish names, right? Okay, why did they change their names? Okay, because it was important that you not be too Jewish. That was a thing of, you know, uh, dress British and think Yiddish. And it was important for me growing up. My mother said, I said, I think at one point I said, hey, I want to go into entertainment. She said, well, change your name to Robert Mann. Okay? It wasn't so much that it was anti-Semitism. It was this idea of you needed to fit in. You couldn't be too Jewish. And that's interesting because there's another book that I recommend, The Haunted Smile. And this is about Jewish comedians in the United States and how they hit, they, they didn't exactly hide their Jewish identity, but more or less they did. Whether it was Jack Benny or, or, or George Burns or Eddie Cantor, The Haunted Smile is about them uh, uh, partly projecting out to an American public that they were not Jewish, not identified as Jewish. And this was especially during the 30s and, uh, and, and even at the start of, uh, uh, of World War II. So, but, oh. Okay, I want to make sure that I get this. So this is Rodney Dangerfield, a little routine, I hope. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, I'm all right now, but last week I was in rough shape, you know? <laughs> well, last week I told my wife, you need a home improvement loan. She gave me $1,000 to move out. <laughs> I'll tell you, my wife, there's always something, you know. Well, the other day I called her up. I said to her, honey, I've been thinking about the last time we had sex. I'm getting excited. She said, who is this? <laughs> I'll tell you, my wife, she never went for me. Well, the first time I called her up, she told me, come on over. There's nobody home. I went over. There was nobody home. <laughs> anyway, my point in showing this is this is the, sort of partly the roots of my Jewish rumor because... In the 50s, this is probably 1958, there I am, I'm whatever, 16, 17 years old. I'm at Jerry Lewis Brown Derby. I'm seeing all these comedians. I understand I'm Jewish. I do understand besides their name, they're Jewish. And I understand this is something our people do. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is something I do. We're funny for money. Ended up being a cartoonist, but being a stand-up was a comedian was the road that I didn't take. And this is interesting. Now, of course, Henny Youngman was the king of the one-liners, right? Pushing 50 isn't the problem, it's pulling 49. Look, children are just pathetic substitutes for people who can't have pets. I'm a citizen of the world, but I'm based in my own. You know, I don't know what I do without her, but I'd like to find out. Well, okay, that's not true. That's not Henny Youngman. All of those jokes are my jokes. Yes, my jokes, all of those were cartoons that I did for the New Yorker. The reason I'm showing these is to show that this kind of, in some ways I did become a stand-up. I wrote the jokes, 
but I was influenced by the jokes I heard. So those are, my point is, those aren't Henny Youngman jokes, those are my jokes, and my influence was the Borscht Belt. Of course, when I was going there, I didn't know about Freud, I didn't know about the Talmud, I didn't know about that. And I don't think there's a direct line, but there is a line to it. Uh, so next, people ask me, how do I get my ideas for cartoons? I say, I think of them. That's a joke, that's a, uh, Rodin sculpture, the lovers. I did this for a college class. They didn't know what it was. Okay, but you're you're a smart audience. You know what it is. Okay, and if I would say, what is the one of the characteristics of my cartoons? What is the characteristics of Jewish humor or Jews in general? We're thinkers. Okay, not all of us. There are a lot of dopes. <laughs> okay. But overall, I think we're thinkers and we're even overthinkers. That's why we invented psychoanalysis so that we could overthink everything, okay? And because of that, an, a, lot, a number of the jokes I've done on this overthinking are, are to do about being at the shrink. Here's two of them. Wow, you need professional help. <laughs> See, why? Who is this guy then? And this also, I think, is point, another one I did about being at the shrink. Look, making you happy is out of the question, but I can give you a compelling narrative for your misery. I think that's also very Jewish, actually. Just so long as we have some sort of story, some sort of joke that console us and make sense of it, that's the best we can hope for. Now, maybe that's a little too gloomy, and maybe that's because I'm from this generation, okay? People that, well, had it a little background me. How did I become a cartoonist? Well, I went to the, I went to the high school of music and art, where I studied art. That's my graduation picture in 1962. And look at that dude next to me, Edward Barak. Now that in itself is funny, right? That in itself is funny. Edward Barak in 1962 has a pipe. <laughs> He's posing for his high school picture for a pipe. So I wondered when I was writing my memoir, whatever happened to Edward Barak? And this is what happened to him. The art of Edward Barak, Dean of American Pipe Design. He became the Dean of American Pipe Designers. Just imagine what I could have accomplished if I had smoked a pipe, but I didn't. Instead, I went to music and art in 1962 really interesting. That photo is interesting too. I think for, at that time, I think, I don't know, maybe the photographer was Jewish because I think he gave all the Jewish guys nose jobs. Because that, that's not my nose. Okay. <laughs> it's, but I don't know what was happening. But anyway, but I went to, I, then I left uh, I went to Syracuse University. That's me in 1966 where I majored in hair and fooled around a lot. It was the 60s, uh, didn't do, it was the, thing, the thing I regret mostly is how few drugs I did. And now I'm so old, I can't do them anymore. So that was my shot, I sort of missed it. But you know what, you can't look back. Okay, here's me, I go to graduate school, I'm on the cusp of my getting my PhD in experimental psychology, but it's the world's longest cusp and I quit. Uh, I told my father I was going to quit. I'm going to be a cartoonist. And my father told me, you know, they already have people who do that. And I said, yeah, dad, but one of them might die. <laughs> I submitted lots of cartoons to the New Yorker. Rejected, rejected, rejected. But finally they did accept the one. And then this rejection slip changed to this. I'm not even going to read that. It's so vulgar, but it's funny. It's funny. Oh. <laughs> I'm having fun. Uh, <laughs> okay, and so here's my best known cartoon. No Thursdays out of how, but never, never to do. I've done five, 10,000, but that's the one to put my daughter through college, through reprints. Uh, it's in the Yale Book of Quotations. There it is, pretty good, right next to that other famous humorous Mao Tse Tung. Oh, can't see that. Uh, 
There are some of my cartoons, a little sampling of the thousands I've done, Hamlet's duplex. Now that's product placement. I'm sorry, dear, I wasn't listening. Could you repeat what you said since we've been married? Uh-oh, your coverage doesn't seem to include illness. On the one hand, eliminating the middleman would result in lower costs, increased sales, and greater consumer satisfaction. On the other hand, with a middleman. This, this cartoon gets reprinted so many times, I wouldn't say it's funny, but I would say it basically sums up existence which I think makes up for maybe not being that funny. Uh, it, I, this gets reprinted all the time in textbooks and the professors thank me for it also. So it feels good because I didn't get a PhD and have all these PhDs thanking me for it. There is no justice in the world. There is some justice in the world. The world is just. And this is called What Lemmings Believe. And so I did write a memoir, How About Never is Never Good for You. And in the first chapter, it was called, I'm not arguing, I'm Jewish. And that's my experience of getting my first wife wasn't Jewish. My second wife was, and my third wife, Corey Scott Whittier, definitely not Jewish. And in my early courting her, when we were having discussions and conversations about things, she would say, why are you arguing with me? And that's what I said. I'm not arguing. I'm Jewish. And every once in a while, I have to still say it. But you know what? I realized maybe I actually am arguing. <laughs> and maybe it's the same thing. Uh, but I'm not this Jewish. And remember, if you need anything, I'm available 24-6. And that is the cartoon on our book. Have I got a cartoon for you, the moment book of Jewish cartoons. There's, I've written an introduction. Raj Chast has written a very interesting forward. Here's some of the cartoons. Too Jewish? Abraham, must I sacrifice family for a career? I had that only worse. This doesn't seem like a Jewish cartoon, but it definitely is. Any other hobbies besides suffering? I'm not beached, I just don't swim on Saturdays. We got you a dreidel. <laughs> Go away, we're still Jewish. Fetch dirty to me, honey. He's all right, I just wish you were a little bit more pro-Israel. Both Christney, both Brith. I still want grandchildren. And here's the last one in the book done by Lars Kenseth, who is not Jewish, <laughs> but he knows how to do a Jewish cartoon. It killed him to call. Anyway, all those cartoons are available on cartooncollections.com for a mug, t-shirt, whatever you want. Let's say you have like a Goodyear blimp that you want one of these cartoons on. Yeah, we'll put it on that also. Okay, I am now open to questioning and interrogation. How do I do that, Suzanne? Uh, if you want to just hit stop share. Okay. I have stopped sharing now. Great. Thank you so much for that hilarious presentation. It was wonderful. Um, so if people have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box and we will hopefully get to them. Uh, but to start off, what are your suggestions do you have for writing captions? Keep them short, put the punchline at the end. Don't use exclamation marks. Something doesn't become funnier when you shout it. <laughs> so if you're talking about writing captions for the caption contest, look at everything in the picture. Try to see what the different frames of reference are. Don't search for the caption like you would for a phone number or somebody's name. It's not there. It's not there to search for and try to remember. It's there to associate things in the picture with, sort of like you're an improv comedian. Create a lot of them and show them to your friends. And send me them to me, them to me and for $20, I'll tell you which one is best. <laughs> well, that leads actually to the next question of, which comes first, the caption or the illustration? Uh, 
it's different for different cartoonists and often it's an interactive process where you might start off with a, often you won't really start off with anything complete so it's almost like a caption contest itself right you might be thinking about like the term woke as in you know relating to uh, social justice right and you'll just think about it woke alarm clock you'll you know you'll write things down and then you might draw somebody waking up to an alarm clock and so it could be it, it could go back and forth sometimes you just do think of the caption you might like it might be a caption like uh you'll definitely often think of the caption first if in fact the picture the image is just sort of a placeholder for saying something funny like let's say i might say why should i do anything for posterity what has posterity ever done for me okay that's funny but anybody could be saying it really now it could be i could then think oh maybe in these times that'll work better if it's a younger person saying it to their older person or father or something like that or uh uh, uh you know, if I think of a line like, uh, I like living in the past, it's where I grew up. So th then it'll be that. On the other hand, if, if I, I might be fooling around, fooling around drawing something, like a guy in front, so I might draw just a standard situation, like a boss and, and the, there's a guy in front of him. But I might start fooling around with the drawing of that person okay and i might all of a sudden contort him in some way or i'm just fooling around i'm i mean one of the things is it's not like oh you just sit down and you like rattle these off you're often sitting and nothing is coming just like if you'd be writing anything or writing a novel right and you're in a way you're doodling either you're doodling actually physically with what you're drawing and your mind doodling also so then i might contort the guy and have him in some funny position and then the boss would be say, say uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Harris, uh, the, la the language of dance has always eluded me. So, <laughs> and that may, ha that may be because I've been reading something in the art section of the time where they're talking about the language of dance. And when I see a phrase like the language of dance, then I, my comedy, my comic antenna go up I know the language of dance is something I can repurpose. And so it might happen, I'm just saying it might happen that organic way rather than just one or the other. Thank you. Um, was there ever a time that um, a cartoon that was published received a, a reaction that was not anticipated, whether it was an, a reaction of anger, confusion, or anything else? Never. There never was a time when any cartoon published in New Yorker received any anger, confusion. Everybody always got every single cartoon. No one was ever angry at any cartoon of all the 86,000 we published. And I sent that to the Guinness Book of World Records, and they were astonished that this was the case. Of course, <laughs> I answered your question. <laughs> Okay, I'll one time in particular you can think of? Definitely, of course. And people, people, especially, it's much more exaggerated now, but even when I was there, I left three years ago, all of uh, uh, woke culture was already awoke, okay, to everything. So if you had a joke that was set in prison, how could you have any joke set in prison when, the, when we have the incarceration crisis we, do, we have? Uh, so anything, everything has started to become connected to everything else. So people, people were often most offended if you made any joke about, well, let's say you had a joke in which one woman was talking to another and she said, which we did, uh, I've only been gluten-free for two weeks, but I'm already annoying. Well, you get hundreds of letters that being, you know, we suffer, it's the worst thing in the world. It's almost as bad as irritable bowel syndrome or, you know, all of the sufferers. And, you know, the, uh, uh, 
So, so the, those are the kinds of things that, that were, were, were present then, and I think are more present now. So that now all, all of a certain part of culture is completely uh, uh, on guard, let's put it away, to not in any way, see, because it's different now. Because then it would be an individual who was upset. Now it could be a social media mob. So I do feel it's very, very chilling, and I'm happy I'm out of that part of it, really, because where you could no, you could no longer, you couldn't make, you, you absolutely, so, you, you know, whether it would be the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter, in other words, you couldn't make any satire about any of it. You, you can't, because that, because this is, this is completely sacrosanct now. And I think that's bad for everyone, really, because, because humor is the canary in the coal mine. It means you can't talk about it. You can't talk about it in any way but the right way. Humor is the indicator that you can't talk, that you, you, you at first, you know, it's the old joke. At first they came for the Jews. At first they came for the comedians. But eventually everything becomes completely restricted. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, someone said you did not show any political cartoons. Are those ever examples of Jewish humor? Not particularly. You know, not distinctly Jewish humor. You know, I mean, of course, there's, there, there, are, there are Jewish editorial cartoons, but I think the hallmark of Jewish humor is it being self-reflective about yourself. And that's why it has a deep sense of humor. Humor as ridicule is a powerful weapon. Uh, example, Trump. Trump, you know, Trump may not be funny to you, but he's funny to his base, okay? And it's, uh, 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 he's funny to his base. And that's the kind of humor, to me, editorial cartoons, of course they can be great, but they're very, very blunt. It's like cheering for your side, okay? You're already, the, it's not like an editorial cartoon ever convinces someone on the other side. So, uh, but I don't think, I don't, didn't show any of them because they're not distinctly Jewish. And to some extent, I think the idea of distinctly Jewish humor is historic more than present because Jewish humor became part of American humor, became part of, 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 of what it meant to be a comedian, to look inward, to reflect, to do that. So it's just like, uh, uh, black music became part of American music. Jewish humor became one of the main streams in American humor that changed it from the humor of the 19th century, which was tall tales and anecdotes and stories, which are fascinating. I'm just reading a book, uh, a couple of books about Abraham Lincoln, who used humor very powerfully, always to a point. But these were rather, these were long stories and parables and anecdotes. And humor be, when humor became a commodity, a commercial commodity transferable from one place in that that became compressed. And, and that, I mean, it's a whole story about vaudeville, immigration, all of that. Thank you. Uh, is Jewish humor any different from Israeli humor? I hope so. Why? I, I, don't, I don't know, even know what I mean. Like that. It's just a joke. I knew I could make you laugh because it meant somehow that I wasn't that crazy about Israelis. <laughs> the, the, the Israelis are just too confident. You know what I mean? They're not neurotic enough. I really, I don't, yeah, I mean, the, I, I really don't know. I'm not an expert. I would think it definitely is because the humor that exists as part of the United States and England and the, the heterogeneity of the society that you're in, ra rather than the homogeneity of the si society that you're in. So I don't, it's not the best uh, uh, milieu, I think, for great humor. Of course, the hysterical, funny Israeli comedians, I don't know them. But on the other hand, you don't have hysterical, amazing, Israeli comedians on YouTube that everybody's listening to or have cre created the kind of humor literature that's worldwide. Whereas, you know, in terms of American, America, that, that humor is shared worldwide. Okay. 
Uh, someone would like to know what part of the Bronx did you grow up in, and do you think that Jews from the Bronx are funnier than Jews from other bur boroughs? <laughs> I left when I was two, so uh, so when I went to the Toddlers Comedy Club when I was a year and a half, I don't think there was that much influence on me. So, uh, but the, the uh, what I know about after the war, leaving from the Bronx in Brooklyn, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the Jews that ended up in Queens, there wasn't, humor wasn't the thing that distinguished them. It was the baseball teams they rooted for. If you came from Brooklyn, you rooted for the Dodgers on 169th Street off of Union Turnpike. If you came from the Bronx, you rooted either for the Yankees or the Giants. The Dodger fans and uh, the Giant fans, they, they eventually, or their children became Mets fans. And the Yankee fans and the other ones from the Bronx, the Yankee fans remained Yankee. I remained the Yankee fan. What about between the uh, genders? Is humor different for men and women? And who's funnier? <laughs> I think they're different. I think they're complementary. Uh, I think historically women's humor has been suppressed because, uh, but the, has been suppressed because humor was, it wasn't ladylike for one thing, and the kind of humor that, that dominates when you look at ridicule, it's very aggressive, it's often obscene, it's all, all sorts of things that, that didn't comport with this idea of what it meant to be feminine. So, uh, and then even after that is sort of disappears, the ability to be funny and grow up and, and grow up and be funny is partly the ability or the permission to misbehave. And so if you will look at many people who are comics, there are also people who got in trouble in school. Uh, the clowns, the cut-ups, I got in trouble. Uh, but was I? But what was going to happen to me if I got in trouble for fooling around? I mean, it's interesting. You could go into this a little deeper. It'd be, hey, he's just a boy. He, that's what they do. They're cut ups. They're clowns. It, for for a girl, it would have been strange to to all of a sudden jump up in class, and you know, I'm not even when I was in high school. I might. <laughs> uh, I did this in college too. I mean. Uh, I, I was just sort of a, a real, so like in high school, the teacher might call on me and I might not know anything about it, but I would get up very confidently and start talking. Like maybe uh, you, you're old enough to remember Professor Irwin Corey, who was the expert on everything. And I would just, and most people who didn't know anything would just shut up. And I would say, well, that's a very interesting question. And there's many thoughts I've had, and I'd like to actually talk a little bit more about it. And maybe go in a little deeper than your original question all the time. Okay, so this is like nuts, right? And the class is going crazy. The teacher is pissed. Maybe the teacher is also entertained in some way. When I was in college, I used to sit in these huge lecture halls can't do this now anymore because I'm older. And I used to make from the bottom of my throat a very high pitched sound. <laughs> but it was like ventriloquism and it didn't seem like it was coming from me. And everyone started <laughs> looking around with, and I'd be looking around too and everything. And so I would do this periodically and I just got a tremendous kick out of it. And it was interesting because I remember I got in a huge argument with the professor because eventually I got caught and then we're going to take the exam and he isolates me because he doesn't want me to cheat. I said, this is ridiculous. Just because I made that sound, you know, it was like a Jewish thing, like a Talmudic thing. Just because I was making that high pitched sound, does, what makes you think that I also cheat? They, they don't have any relation to each other. So, but my, my feeling to do this and the manic energy that I had for it, I think, I don't think many, many girls would have done at that time. It would have seen they would have maybe ended up, be, you know, being thought that they were crazy or something like that. But also I think there's something male in it, in pranking and in, I guess think there's a little bit more aggression. 
So I think men and women to say who is funnier, I think that's sort of wrong in that. Well, if you look at the caption contest, well, men enter, but in terms of who wins, anybody can win based on the proportions. I think if there, I do think there are biological differences and therefore some other kinds of differences. It could be aggression, it could be all sorts of things that were shaped by a huge evolution. So the way I see the humor having developed, but if there were no biological differences at all between men and women, culture has shaped them differently. So the humor would come out different. Just like the writing comes out different. Do, do men and women write the same books? Do they do that? So uh, what I see is that women have a sort of deeper sense of humor and the humor is often about things that concern them, about relationships, you know, that where men's humor can be, uh, and these are the extremes, there's lots of overlap, it could be very mechanical, which is just like joke math. Like I can see, uh, like I will do jokes like Hamlet's duplex. It's just joke math. It's not about anything, it's not about Hamlet, it's not about Shakespeare, it's not about anything, but it's n there's nothing there but a joke. I don't think women are really drawn to this because they're more drawn to relationships, they're more interested, in other things. So I do think they're very, very complimentary. And I think there's a lot of really great women's humor because of that, because it's about these sort of deeper issues. Anyway. Thank you. Uh, now that we are five and a half months into the pandemic, uh, have pandemic? To... why didn't someone tell me? <laughs> I can't believe it. Have, have jokes changed? Clubs. I've been at, oh, I, am I the only one out at these clubs? I guess I am. I guess that's why when I was dancing to all this music, nobody else was there. I'm happy you told me. <laughs> now, 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 now that we've been in it for quite a while, have the jokes changed at all over this time, you think? Well, we've got a lot of on cartoon collections and also cartoon stock, which is our sister's I have a million COVID jokes and Zoom jokes. And, you know, I think the jokes are really so easy in a way because, first of all, everyone can relate to them. You know, I could say, hey, you know, for this meeting, I put on a new pair of sweatpants. You should be very happy. You know, it's like, it's like everybody relates to it. So yeah, lots of, lots, there are lots of jokes about, uh, uh, obviously about what we're going, about Zoom meetings, Zoom fatigue, Zoom nausea, Zoom, you know, whatever, and uh, uh, about working from home. Uh, uh, you know, a woman saying to her husband, well, maybe you can work from somebody else's home. And, you know, it, I mean, there's a lot of good jokes and a lot, a lot, of come, a lot will uh, uh, come out of it. I mean, we're all, uh, I mean, the way I uh, originally, what I, some joke I made, which not really a cartoon, is said, well, we're going through a real historic event here, but I, I was happier when history was something that happened in the past. <laughs> and the, the other idea is that, especially when it first happened, it was like, we're in the B-roll of a sci-fi movie. <laughs> you know, it's the B-roll. <laughs> It's like nobody's on the streets, everything's empty, but no, but there's nothing happening. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's really something and I'm looking, uh, I'm looking forward is all I can say. Like I was saying, next year, next year in Jerusalem, next year, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere in Europe, somewhere having a vacation. <laughs> next, you know, now I'm thinking of a joke, next year, Anywhere but here. <laughs> Anywhere but here. Which, which we're going to wrap it up with this last um, question because we're, we're out sure. of time. But how many captions do you write for one cartoon until you find that perfect one? I, I would only, uh, for a normal cartoon, it would only be one or two. If it were, if it were someone like someone, Larry Woods, who, who's won the caption contest seven times and is a friend of mine, he'll write four or five or six for a caption contest. And then he'll show it to friends. But usually I'll, I'll write one uh, and hopefully it's the right one. 
Anyway, thanks everybody. It's been great. Thank you so much for this enjoyable hour. I want to just uh, remind everybody that Moment Magazine does have a caption contest of its own that uh, Bob created. It's a little bit easier to win than the New Yorker caption contest. All you have to do to, is uh, go to momentmag.com and uh, search for the cartoons. You can see uh, what cartoons we have up for our coming up issue where you can take your uh, own hand a stab at um, writing them. You can also vote for previous ones. Uh, we have people write in and you can uh, vote which one you think is the best one. Um, also, please uh, go to, tell, tell the website again, Bob. Cartooncollections.com. It's 30,000 New Yorker cartoons, all of these Jewish cartoons. And we also have a caption contest there as well. Yes, and so we will send next week um, a, a follow-up email with all of these links, along with ways to purchase Bob's book, as well as all of the books from the rest of the Jewish Book Festival. And we thank you very much for coming. Thank you again, Bob. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Tracy. And we look forward to hopefully seeing everybody in person next year. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.